Hi everyone, today I'm going to be providing a commentary and breakdown of some time-lapse footage of me sculpting and painting this creature artwork that I'm calling Looper. We're going to be skipping through different parts of the time-lapse and I'll explain my full process at every stage as we work through it. Before we start, I should say that the full blend file for the final artwork can be found on my Patreon under the $10 tier, which gets you access to my personal art files. There's also a copy of the final render scene without the final sculpt on the $5 tier, which gets you access to exclusive resources. So let's jump into it. So first of all, I always start with a general block out. This starts as a cube with a subdivision surface modifier applied. With a cube selected, you can press Ctrl and one of the number keys to automatically set up the modifier at the appropriate subdivision level. Then it's just a matter of going into edit mode and extruding, moving, and scaling different parts of the mesh to start blocking out a basic shape that you're going to sculpt over. When I'm doing this, I'm not trying to get an accurate shape for what I want the end result to be. In fact, at this point I don't even know exactly what I want to make, because this piece is mostly improvised. But I do know that I want to do something fox-like and ethereal, something otherworldly and possibly more akin to a religious interpretation of some kind of spirit. When it comes to limbs or appendages, I don't really care about having smooth transitions in the block out because that would just be a waste of time here. At this point though, it's nice to get a general sense of proportions because that will last throughout the entire process. So as we're skipping ahead, I've got the silhouette of where I want to sculpt things, and I'm thinking about adding a tail of some kind just to give us something asymmetrical at the end. Again, no time is wasted in setting this up. Fox type creatures tend to have bushy tails, so I'll do something thick. We can always inflate or deflate the mesh later when sculpting. So now the block out is done, I'm trying to get my settings with sculpting for dynamic topology set up. It's been quite a while since I've done any proper sculpting, so I need to familiarize myself with the settings again. For this project, I'll be using the constant detail mode instead of the relative detail. This means that the density of the geometry will stay consistent over the surface of the mesh. I test different levels of constant detail, and then when I find one I think is appropriate, I will press the Detail Flood Fill button to make that detail level consistent across the entire mesh. Then it's just a matter of starting to chisel away at the base mesh to sculpt it into shape. My preferred default brush for most of the work is the Clay Strips brush, but as you'll see throughout the rest of the footage, I'll be making use of a range of different tools. As I start to trim away different parts of the mesh, I'm kind of just giving myself an idea of maybe what I want the end shape to look a bit more like. And as you'll see popping up on the screen occasionally, I'm actually trying out the new Sculpt Wheel tool by JF Matthew. I'll leave an affiliate link in the description if you want to check that out. Basically it's a way of accessing the Sculpt tools via a Pi menu, and it's super clean, it's customizable, and I actually had quite a lot of fun playing with it. I don't spend too long on any particular part of the body, I'm just moving around the different areas, adding and removing vertex data. I tend to get into a technique of adding clay strips and then smoothing them down immediately afterwards. It's quite an easy way to build up geometry. Although you'll also see me here in the footage move between the inflate and scrape brush. The inflate brush is good for if you have areas with tight geometry, like with the legs. You'll find that if you try and sculpt over these with larger additive brushes, you can sometimes create some geometry errors. But the inflate brush is quite good for this because it tries to expand the mesh in all directions. So it's very handy for doing limbs if you want to give yourself more geometry to work with. The scrape brush is pretty nice because it feels like just scraping clay away. It's nice for starting to chisel away some flat surfaces. You can see that as we're building up more and more, the original harsh outlines of the block out tend to fade away. And here what I'm doing is I'm just placing an eye as a reference point for later on in the sculpt. Using a separate model for the eye gives you a target to move around, and because it's a different object it means you won't accidentally change the shape of it while in sculpt mode. Here I'm just adjusting the back position of the tail because the shape of the body has changed since the block out. And now I'm just moving on to getting a basic shape for the paws, using the crease brush to outline the different areas of the toes. But now I've got the block out into a nicer shape, now I'm going to move on to one of the techniques I like to do for improvised meshes, which is adding random additive details. Basically if I don't know exactly what I want to make, I will add details in random areas that I think might work to inspire myself into a new direction. So a brush I like using for this is the snake hook tool because it's very easy to smudge the clay into different areas. 
This is good for getting different layering effects and for easily distorting the surface of the mesh. Now I'm intentionally going over the top to start with, with putting details everywhere, but you'll see why in a minute. Because for ideation like this, I tend to work in cycles of adding extreme amounts of detail, then simplifying, then adding more details and simplifying on loop until I reach a final result that I like. Now I'm not working entirely with references here, I do have one reference which is a model of a fox. But other than that, as I said, this is a mostly improvised piece, so we're dealing with ideation skills more than mimicry. So you can see here that after I've added a ton of additive details, what I'm doing now is I'm going through and trying to add contours, so defined lines and shapes that flow in between the details. What this will do is give me an outline for where to focus on adding the larger detail areas. Because when it comes to making visually pleasing artwork, you should be aiming to have some areas of high, medium and low distributions of detail. I've recommended many times before, Gleb Alexandrov did a nice talk about this at the Blender conference, and it's based on a really informative article by Neil Blevins. So now, as I said, I've moved on to a simplification part of this cycle, where instead of adding random details, I'm now simplifying the details that were there because I think there's a bit too much on these front legs. But as I'm scraping away on this, I'm noticing that they're bent in a slightly strange way. So once I'm done with simplifying this, I'll start adding some mesh content to the front of the legs just to balance out the angle. The purpose of throwing in a random sphere here is just for final artwork. In my mind, it represents something, but it's just giving me some more visual balance when looking at the creature as a whole. So what you can see here now is that I'm starting to experiment with adding some more larger detail areas. Now as I'm adding them, I'm also undoing them as I don't think they work. So I'm just experimenting, adding areas of specific detail. If I don't like them, I'll get rid of them or simplify them down, but there's no harm in trying. Now some people might ask, what's the point of adding all these random details if you're just going to simplify them anyway? Well the point here is because we're talking about improvisation and ideation skills, distorting your mesh with random details is one technique you can use to inspire yourself into a new direction if you don't have an end goal in mind. The same thing applies with any other kind of modeling, like hard surface modeling. And I talked a bit more about that in my tips for building a kitbash library video. So again using the crease brush I'm just experimenting with adding contours, additive and subtractive lines in between these areas. But now I really want to add some larger shapes to the main body. So kind of keeping in mind the contours that I had already placed down, I'm using the snake hook brush to add some larger sweeping shapes. So again, it's just part of this constant flow of disturbing the mesh, using the new look to inspire new areas to add more details and curvature, and then simplifying into a more defined shape. So now I want to give a bit more attention to the tail. I didn't really know what to do here. In fact, throughout the entire process, I ended up adding detail and then completely removing it and then adding it again to the tail. I'll do this on repeat until I get something I like. Again, the scrape brush comes in handy when removing details because it tends to leave behind this nice stylized look, as if you've taken a knife to a clay model and refined the shape. But now I've added some stuff to the tail, I'm going to go back to the main body, and I want to refine these large sweeping shapes that I've made. But before we do that, I'm just going to cut away some areas of the mesh. Now a technique I use for this is to take mirrored cubes, and then use a boolean difference operation to chop away. I'll then keep a copy of those cubes lying around just in case I want to do any more cutting later. Now I'll keep looking around the mesh to see what I can do, but at this point I feel like there's just so much curvature with the creature that I want to add an extra prop to go along with it. Something a bit more hard surface, and something that still complies to the whimsical style of the piece. So I decide to add a lantern that's tied around the neck of the creature. I'll use a curves object to get the string or collar. And then I'll just go back into the sculpting mode and add some details around where it's imprinting into the surface of the creature. Then I spend a bit of time making the candle from a cylinder. Sculpting a tiny bit of detail there, but of course we don't need to spend too long here because the camera is never going to be close up on the lantern. Alright, now I'm going back to a different area of the mesh, starting with the nose and mouth, just refining it down a bit more. 
I think at this point I also increased the constant detail level in the dynamic topology settings, just to give me a bit more geometry to work with. Now I know that I've settled down with the major shape of the creature, so I'm not going to be making any more large sweeping changes. So now I'm going to add some more finer contour details. So again, since I'm going for something that's a bit more like a religious statue, I'm going to go for some repeating pattern, something that feels a bit handmade. But again, I don't stick on doing one thing for too long. After getting an idea for what kind of patterns I want on the mesh, I'll go back and refine some of the larger shapes. So you see I'm making some of these sweeping areas a bit more pointy. I'll keep using both the snake hook brush and the crease brush for this. For the crease brush, of course, if you just use it normally, it digs into the mesh. But if you hold control, it will create a nice ridge. In my mind, these wavy shapes represent the fur. But since it's all very solid and tightly packed together, I get a kind of ceramic vibe from it. And I'll hone in on this ceramic feel once we get to the whole rendering and material creation process. At this point I do realise as well that at some point in the process I turned off symmetry on the x-axis. But this is no big deal, I don't show you how we do it in the footage, but what I essentially do is I use a boolean to chop off half of the mesh, and then remove the face in between, then add a mirror modifier, slightly increase the merge distance, and that reconstructs the other side of the mesh for me. There are some other tools you can use to do that automatically, but it really doesn't take that much time or effort anyway. So now I'm going back to adding some of these repeating, almost fractal patterns. I choose two main areas of the mesh to do this. So, so far we've done under the neck, but now I'm doing by the belly. When you look at this from side on, I think it looks quite nice. These are the softer areas of the body where we're adding the finer details. So this just goes to show that when improvising, you can turn something completely random into something that looks nice. You see, all of these shapes are defined by our completely random process of adding and simplifying details earlier on in the process. It's like the butterfly effect. The curves and detail areas that you decide on earlier on in the process will define what the shape looks like at the end. So now I'm getting happier with how this model looks, I'm going to add some more definition to the curvature. So this means making some of the lower areas deeper with the crease brush, and also elevating some of the higher areas as well. I decide here that the eye needs to be enlarged slightly, just to fit with the rest of the shape. And now the tail needs a bit more definition just to follow on with the darker lines that we've got on the body. So now I've gone for another color change again with the matte cap and I'm just adding some finer details that most people will never see, but it just makes it feel more complete to me. Oh, and here's another tip as well. If you press Alt and B, you can draw a render region, so you can choose to only show a slice of the mesh. This is good for letting you look around the object if you have other areas of the mesh in the way. And to show everything again, you can just press Alt B again and it will clear the region. Now when I started doing this, I didn't know whether I wanted to texture it or not, but then Charon from Just 3D Things convinced me to, so I did it. So I want to follow on from the whole ceramic idea. So I just gave it a base brown color and I'm going to add some painted details on. Now keeping this in mind, everything that I painted here was going to be amplified by a material later on. So I'm just going for highlights, I'm highlighting the core areas of curvature. Now as for getting the UV mats for this object, I was very lazy, and yes I did just do the smart UV project. The original mesh was about 1 million vertices, so I decimated it down to half a million and then did the smart UV project. But yes, if you've done this lazy way before, you'll know that this does create a lot of anomalies where different areas of the UV islands overlap. So you'll see that there are some random splodges of color over the mesh. But I really don't mind this because we're going to be rendering the character from a certain distance away. It's not really going to matter that much. As for the color scheme, you can see that I've chosen colors and patterns that are almost ancient Egyptian in style. So we've gone for golden and royal blues. And once this is all done, I set up the materials for the different objects. Now, as for the main body of the character, you can see the main material here. What I'm doing is I'm feeding the painted texture into the base color. But what I'm also doing is taking the ambient occlusion data, filtering it through a color ramp, mixing it with a noise texture to feather it a bit, and then using that to darken the base color before it goes into the principal BSDF shader. And just for getting some simple bump variation on the surface, I'm also feeding a noise texture through a color ramp through the bump node, and then into the normal input. So you can see here what it looks like, we've got some darkened areas, the normal input is giving us this nice glossy ceramic style to it, and the painted details shine through. 
And to make the scene really pretty, I'm using some techniques I showed you in my Create Beautiful Atmospheric Renders in Eevee video, which was done in cooperation with Sketchfab. And this is what the final workspace looks like. And then here's the final result after post-processing. But one more thing I want to show you is with the new viewport denoising with cycles, you can get some really cool painterly effects. So here's an example of the denoising trying to interpret the look of this model. So yes, if you want to explore this file in more detail, then as I said, the final art file is available on the $10 tier of the Patreon, but a simplified version of the render scene is available on the $5 tier, along with other exclusive resources. But hopefully you found this interesting, and if you did, then feel free to leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell. You can also follow me on social media or join our Discord server to take part in discussions, share your work, take part in challenges, and also get sneak previews of upcoming projects. So thanks for watching everyone, stay safe, have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Oh yeah, by the way, this entire thing was done with a mouse and keyboard. I don't like using a tablet for my skulls. Please don't hurt me, it's just what I prefer using. Bye bye!